progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return to our examination, both in Ezekiel and in the book of Judges, shall we seek our Heavenly Father's guidance and ask of him his blessing so that we may more correctly understand the symbols that are being presented before us and apply these so that we may understand the message that we are yet to give to this world. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we may spend together today. I thank you for each that have taken the time to attend this meeting. Be with us now, direct us so that that which you would have us to understand becomes clear. <clears throat> We ask, Father, that your angels surround us, that your spirit be with us. For as you have stated, where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. Help us now that we may have faith in the path on which we're being guided. that we may look to you and to you alone for all that we need in giving a message, a final message to this world. Direct us now. Be with us, we pray in Jesus name. Amen. <clears throat> okay. You said there's some things you wanted to share. Yeah, well, so Stephen's corrected me on a couple of points. And uh, so the first one has to do with uh, in Ezekiel chapter 10 here, we have this, or not Ezekiel, what am I saying? Judges chapter 10. Right. Um, we have the, it talks about the uh, Philistines and the children of Ammon that are, are these enemies. And then it talks about the land of the Amorites. And um, I mistakenly sort of uh, made the suggestion that that these are sometimes used interchangeably, the same people. But the, the children of Ammon, I think it's the river uh, Arnon that borders. Anyway, it's something to do with the border between the Ammonites and the Amorites. Um, so the Ammonites are east of the Amorites. And the Amorites, that's the land of the Amorites. So it's not really the Amorites that are being mentioned here, because uh, um, this is, which it says, which is in Gilead. So this is going to be um, east of the Jordan River. So hopefully I got that correct. Um, so so the, the children of Ammon are the descend, descendants of... <clears throat> Ben Ami, which is um, means the son of my people, which is a descendant of one of the sons of Lot, and um, uh, so so the Ammonites. Now sometimes there's confusion, and maybe I'm partly confused about it. But I mean, sometimes they'll talk about the children of Ammon, but they will be referring to just people in that area. Um, so I think that's where I was getting confused, but anyway, so Stephen corrected me on that point. And then the other one is in Ezekiel. This one's a little more, um, so this is a spirit of prophecy quote that he sent me. And this is from uh, prophets and Kings page 448. And it says in the sixth year of the reign of Zedekiah, the Lord revealed to Ezekiel in vision some of the abominations that were being practiced in Jerusalem and within the gate of the Lord's house and even in the inner court. The chambers of the images and the pictured idols, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel, all these in rapid succession passed before the astonished gaze of the prophet. Those who should have been spiritual leaders among the people, the ancients of the house of Israel, to the number of 70, 
were seen offering incense before the idolatrous representations that had been introduced into hidden chambers within the sacred precincts of, precincts of the temple. The Lord seeth us not, the men of Judah flatter themselves as they engaged in their heathenish practices. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. They blasphemously declared, and, and uh, they declared. So um, according to Ellen White's quote, this, this would have been happening. Um, now, of course, in there, in this, uh, we know that this is in vision. So, I mean, he's not actually there in Jerusalem. And, and there's no doubt that there's this pagan uh, worship going on. Um, though, from, from what Ellen White's saying, it seems that it is actually happening as he sees it. That is, there is a secret chamber or room in which they actually are practicing this. So, um, so that seems to be fairly clear from her statement. Uh, the idea that um, um, where it talks about, where is it here? Um, the chambers of each and every man in the chambers of his imagery. I can't find the verse. Um, oh, there it is, verse 12, where he says, And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery. So I still think that this is a reference not so much to, even though he sees this uh, room, this chambers of his imagery still would be a reference to what's going on in the heart of these men. And this word, every man, um, so it's just one word. So, you know, there isn't two words here, but it's, it's a singular form. And um, let me see here if I can find this. Um, yeah, so it's just, it's just the word ish, which means a man, and it, and it doesn't have any sort of, so it's not men, um, and in uh, this chamber or the inward part of his imagery, and, and that is the imagination. So even if, I, even if I was wrong on the one part, not thinking that this actually was occurring, but maybe it was, um, still the idea is that what's, what's being... Uh, what, what this is now representing is what's going on in the heart of not just the leaders, but um, really in the people, because the leaders represent the people. So, and, and my point there is that, um, you know, sometimes people are looking for outward sort of idolatry being practiced as, you know, like in the present tense, um, you know, so people will point out that something is some kind of thing is a pagan practice or some name of something is a pagan name, like, you know, trying to, it's usually a false etymology, something like Ishtar must be Easter, and so if we're using Easter, we're pagan. But the, the idea of idolatry really doesn't have to do, you don't have to have pagan deities per se um, to be idolatrous. And, and so to me, this, uh, this part, every man in the chambers of his imagery, it's the, it's the imaginations that we have, the fantasy world we live in, the way we imagine ourselves, uh, the way we compare ourselves with others. These are the things that presently we need to recognize in ourselves. And because we sort of relegate um, idolatry to, you know, images or idols or something that the Catholics are doing or whatever, we don't realize it's a way of avoiding the fact that we are idolatrous. Right. But yeah, so, but I think, you know, Stephen's probably correct that this, 
there were these pagan practices going on. Though he may not have actually been seeing what was going on at that moment, but um, he was able to show the type of practices that were going on. And from Ellen White's quote, it appears these were happening in the precincts of the temple um, you know, structures, the buildings. Any thoughts on that, Stephen? Yeah, um, yeah, I think I pretty much agree with what you've just said. Okay. The impression I got from her writing was things were maybe had been taking place. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the God was sort of showing, showing it to Ezekiel what had been happening. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so the, my main point, I mean, still sort of stands, but... Um, in, but I might have given the impression, you know, there was no idolatry going on, and obviously there was. But I, I still find it amazing that they would do this, like, in the temple precincts itself. But that's what Ellen White says. So, um, you know, like, in such a way that other people know about it. That's pretty brazen, yeah. Um, because, you know, they don't think that God actually sees what they're doing. And... And that's much more common on the individual level. Like, you know, there's a lot of things we won't do in front of others. But if we think no one's looking, uh, we will do them. And, but I know in this day and age, people will do a lot of evil in the public uh, um, that they wouldn't have 20, 30 years ago. Um, and within the church itself, People might have been practicing some things uh, and hiding them, but now everything's done openly. So it's it's kind of scary. Well, we we can look at what happened at Foul Peor too. That was pretty brazen. That was pretty well out, out in the open. Yeah. And, and the golden calf worship and all this stuff. I mean, yeah. Where do you think Satan is going to set up his camp once his God's supposed people turn from God. Yeah. I know it's just here it says, you know, Ellen White, she talks about how people are, what, what is it she says exactly? Um, um, where is it here? Yeah. Um, the Lord seeth us not. You know, the men of Judah flattered themselves as they engaged in their heathenish practices. The Lord had forsaken the earth. Um, though this idea that the Lord seeth not, I mean, um, this is a Hebrew expression, um, which, um, uh, where is that? Uh, I have to find that. Ezekiel 8.10. There it is. Yeah. So, um, is it Ezekiel 8.10? Where he says, the Lord seeth not. I don't see it. Sorry. Sorry, 8.12. Okay. Oh, yeah, there it is. Um, the Lord seeth not. And that word seeth... Um, means often, I mean, it can mean see, perceive, have vision, etc. Um, but it can be uh, that God gives no regard. And so when it says, he seeth it not, and the Lord has forsaken the earth, uh, the idea there can be, um, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't, uh, pay attention to anything anyway. So it's not so much, I mean, there's part of it that the Lord sees us not, but it's in the sense of he's not even looking. It's not like that we're hiding from God. He doesn't really care about what we're doing. Almost sort of a, a um, like it's an attitude about God that's uh, obviously incorrect. And don't, we find it, don't we find uh, the truth? Go ahead, Dwight. 
But we find this repeated in Ezekiel 9, verse 9. Um, Is this a deist thing? Because I heard or I read that the deists believe, yes, God exists, but he has no, no, uh, yeah, he doesn't care about what's happening here on earth. He's just left us to do as we please. Yeah, it's definitely kind of a deist thing. Of course, they're worshiping <clears throat> pagan idols. And, and so part of it, it could be, be that they don't see that God's working on their behalf. And so they're turning to these pagan idols. That could be part of it. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, so in Ezekiel 9.9, 9, you have exactly the same thing, though in inversion. The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. Uh, so they put it in a different... Um, different order? Yeah, different order. And But here you see that um, they're turning to pagan idols. And the reason they worship these idols is just like they would turn to, uh, you know, whether you can have Babylon be your protector or, or Egypt. I mean, you, you have some kind of belief that uh, there are these different powers that can work on your behalf. And so since it appears to them that God's not working on their behalf, they've had these judgments against God, then um, he obviously doesn't care about us. Um, and I think that's part of the idea. So they're turning to these pagan gods, but in reality they've been departing from God for a long time as a nation. So, you know, it's... It's sort of an excuse for their pagan worship. Um, you know, the one thing just to, just to finish this off here with this this idea, um, because you know we're relating this to our lines, and we know that this is a time of self-examination um, to recognize that we. We have this same sort of attitude and uh, you know part of it would be you know even with July 18th um, it may have been indirect uh, but in some cases fairly direct that there was an accusation against God for the failure of the prediction does that make sense to people you understand what I'm well, it does make yeah, sense. I heard it from some people, not in this movement, though. Yeah, well, you know, not necessarily directly, but the idea that God wasn't leading the movement in in that making that prediction, I think, would be a rejection that that God hadn't uh, that God, in a sense, had failed us because we were being led in this direction uh, with all this evidence. And, and Jeff had said before that, you know, if this doesn't occur, I mean, God would have to, you know, because God had led us in this way, um, it would it would definitely be God's fault. I mean, he's not saying it in the sense that God did something wrong, but God would, would basically have to be the one that would answer why it didn't occur. He would have to be held responsible. Yeah, so God was behind it is, is the main point that Jeff was making. And um, so when it did fail, um, you know, people had to make a choice. You know, was God leading us or not? And, and many people just said, well, God wasn't leading us. In a sense, he had forsaken the movement because if the movement was of God, which they tried to claim it was, then why were we brought in this direction? And I never saw any satisfactory answer to this accusation. That is, I mean, there was some blame put upon me as an individual that I had misled the movement. But, but the reality is I hadn't done anything. I mean, I was part of the movement. The movement made the choice to uh, promote the July 18, 2020 prediction. I wasn't there you know, in the meetings in, in 2020, um, you know, I never did any presentations other than the ones I did on November 9th, dealing with uh, the symbol of 273. 
Um, so, you know, so the movement made the decision. And so there wasn't somebody who took over the movement, like in the sense of somebody like Parminder. Parminder actively was subverting the movement. Mm -hmm. But you can't say that about me. And, and Jeff definitely was then the leader in presenting July 18, 2020. And, and if God then had, you know, if the movement had made a mistake in the July 18, 2020 prediction, um, you would either have to blame Jeff or God. So, so when people were rejecting all of the arguments after July 18th, sort of just dismissing them with the wave of a hand, um, instead of examining them, they were, in a sense, saying, God has forsaken the earth. He does not see us. And, and we can go back to whatever it was we were doing before, worshiping the false gods we want to worship, which is our own rationale and ideas. Uh, in this section, what other symbols are we seeing? Um, the section dealing with the, the imagery? Right. Yeah, with Ezekiel the 8, 10 through 12. Yeah. Well, um, well, one of the things is it brings us back to, and, and, and you see this actually in... Um, uh, this this whole thing of the abominations is you know you see this heaven and earth you see now some of this some of this brings us back to Genesis chapter one I guess is what I'm trying to say it's kind of an undoing of creation and and they're going to end up worshiping the creature rather than the creator sort of reminds me of of Romans. Um, Chapter one. So um, then you also have, uh, well, we talked about the digging. Uh, what other things? Well, okay. We have been applying them. Then. Okay, we have been applying these verses as relative to the movement but also to this within the church mm -hmm. so i went in and saw and behold every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and the idols of the house of israel portrayed upon the wall thereabout and there stood before them 70 men of the ancient ancients of the house of israel and in the midst of them stood jazaniah the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Now, Shaphan is, I mean, the, the translation of that name could mean, you know, small rabbit or one that hides. Yeah, species of rock rabbit. Okay. okay. And then there's animals. Then, of course, there's Jazaniah. The Lord has heard her. Yah has heard. Now, the passage that you read that Stephen provided on this out of Prophets and Kings is kind of interesting. In that the chambers of images and the pictured idols, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts, and all of the idols of the house of Israel had passed in rapid succession before the astonished gaze of Ezekiel. But then it says in the next, in the next paragraph, the men of Judah flattered themselves as they engaged in their heathenish practices. So you're talking about, what are you pointing out, the Israel and Judah thing? Well, I'm looking at this. I'm asking the question, what the symbol of the men of Judah would be, because this is going on within the temple. 
Yeah. So this this is the worship in the temple. It's not pointing out the Levites. This is pointing out the nation. So is this pointing out portions of the movement that are holding on to something that they shouldn't hold on to? Okay, I see what you mean. I mean, since 2010, we have seen that there have been areas of disagreement within those that have come into the movement. When the big disagreement came about the book of Joel, and when two flew back to have this conversation with Elder Jeff, he pointed out to them very directly that they were using a Protestant commentary to be able to make their assumption as to the definition of the palmer worm and the, the destructive forces, where if we were using Miller's rules directly, we would establish that it's Rome that establishes the vision. Yeah, and I, I thought their argument was rather weak. Um, rather? Based upon <laughs> trying to use these definitions. So one thing we know about um, uh, nomenclature, you know, biblical nomenclature, like naming of things, is it's really hard to know because you can't usually figure out by context when you have these different insects and so forth named because you just don't have a lot of examples. You don't have encyclopedias. Uh, you know, listing the names of all the different insects and animals and describing what they are. And, and they often do it by, uh, they know that these are borrowed words from other languages, but those same insects can be called different things or the same name can be used for different types of insects in different places. But it seemed like that seemed to be the only real argument they had. Um, but it's pretty obvious, yeah, when you use Miller's rules, that this is referring to Rome. I mean, the, the point here mm -hmm. is in using Miller's rules, they would have been comparing line upon line. Mm -hmm. Yet they made the choice that instead of comparing line upon line, they were going to rely upon the words of men. Mm -hmm. Is that not a type of idolatry? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, now, it's kind of interesting that, you know, Parminder really started talking all about this methodology thing, and, and it became a big issue, right? Um, and, and I remember Tabo, one of the, his arguments against July 18th is it wasn't line upon line. Um, but Parminder wasn't actually using line upon line in accordance with Miller's rules. And um, and then other people have accused me of of making um, methodology a test when it comes to chronology. They say, well, chronology, you're doing the same thing with chronology that um, um, Parminder did with with the lines. Um, but you know, that's just sloppy um, sort of argument um, because we're very methodical when it comes to following Miller's rules. Nothing wrong with looking in a Protestant commentary either, you know, to get a definition of a word or to, um, you know, find some other references. You know, if you're going to look at about who the Ammonites are, uh, it's very helpful to look at some pro Protestant dictionaries and, and they'll refer you to the verses. But you definitely can't use the type of argument uh, that Emiliano was using and, and the others um, to try to prove that Joel was referring to Islam with these different stages of insects. And, and it's pretty clear then, because this was a real argument for the four generations, 
um, that we needed to understand how these worked. And, and, and part of the disappointment I have with all of that is uh, the distractions that happened in 2000, well, from 12, 13, and 14 till finally that the split happened with the movement. And, and it probably even started back earlier, maybe even 2010, is that some of these things that we should have been studying, we got sidetracked from them. And, and I don't think that we really got a good handle on what Joel was all about in the first place. So, you know, so when you look at, because right now we're looking at Ezekiel chapter 8, but, you know, in the context of this movement, dealing with the history of the judges paralleling our history, um, these abominations, they still are in, infecting the movement. And, and I liken this um, uh, second abomination um, to all of the types of speculative theories that really are idols in this movement. And there's such simple things that God has given us you know, to, to understand in his word and that Ellen White has laid out in her counsels. And, and we keep going and looking to, whether it's Protestant commentaries for the answer or to the world or to the media or to the whatever, you know, you know, the underground media, underground knowledge, uh, instead of just following what God has given us. And so, so this idea of these, this second abomination about the chambers of every man in the chambers of his imagery um, would apply to all of those things. Well, <clears throat> chambers of his imagery. I think you were you were correct in looking at this as being the heart. Mm -hmm. And we have to come to this understanding because we have been shown that the Holy Spirit cannot abide anywhere there is an idol. With God, it's all or it's nothing. But it's just what we think of as idols. I mean, you know, pretty much we're, when, when we look at this, we're going to give a definition of an idol. However, we're, gonna, we're going to label it or define it. It's going to be something that isn't the idol we have. Right? Like, it's easy for somebody who's not interested in sports to talk about how sports is idolatry or, you know, whatever it is that, that they're not involved in. But it's much more difficult to recognize the idolatry in our own heart and to label it and to forsake it. Right. Right. So that's part of the problem um, that we all have. You know, we can look at the Catholic Church and we can see that that's idolatry. Um or we can look at paganism, that's idolatry, or we can look at whatever it is uh, that somebody else is doing as idolatry. But the things that we are doing as idolatry are much more harder to, to recognize. But this Doesn't this come right down to the heart of the third angel's message? Mm -hmm. Well, right to, you know, well, right from the first one, fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Well, I'm I'm speaking the Marah. Yeah, well, so the the third step there. Correct. You, yeah. Well, yeah, that's that's the thing, is if we see God as he really is, we will see ourselves as we really are. But that doesn't happen just in a moment. No, it won't. Yeah, because 
you know, when I was converted the first time, and I've mentioned this many times, I mean, the, the scripture that came to my mind is men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And I saw how I was hiding my sins by the things I was trying to do to be a Christian at that time. Um, so well, if, God, if God had showed me everything, though, there's no way that I could have uh, been able to stand. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have made the choice to follow him. I would have been overwhelmed. So he has to lead us step by step. But it does come. In some ways, our first conversion is a revelation of Christ. But that conversion has to continually progress till we come to the point that John did, or Isaiah did, or Ezekiel did. Okay. Or you know Enoch. But in this in this situation, as we're looking at this in Ezekiel eight twelve, then he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? As you pointed out, yesterday was an anniversary. Mm -hmm. Yesterday was. The, was that the 35th or the 45th anniversary of the ending of the Glacier View meetings? Well, so that would have been 1980. Right. So, be so 42 yeah. years, sorry. Yeah, so 42 years. Yeah. Okay. So we have 42 years since the ancients of the house of Israel, the leaders of the church at that time, chose to do something very much in the dark. They were in agreement with Desmond Ford, yet they didn't wish to publicly pronounce that they were in agreement with Desmond Ford. Mm -hmm. We have seen the desolation that has come upon the church in these 42 years since the close of that meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and you know, and I became an Adventist uh, December 25th, 1982. So two and a, you know, two years and whatever it is, four months after Glacier View. Um, and definitely the church was in a, there was, I guess, looking back, I, I, you know, because at the time I didn't know what was going on, but there was kind of a tension that had existed because of Glacier View. There was kind of a, uh, people were now sort of jockeying for position of where they stood on this, this issue. Um, so... It, definitely the church was really affected by what happened because Desmond Ford was, he was a star in Adventism. Correct? Right. Yeah. I mean, he was a star. It'd be like um, Doug Batchelor, um, you know, going into apostasy or something like that. Um, so many, many people left the church following Desmond Ford. Many ministers had resigned, all kinds of people, you know, uh, we're very upset about what had happened with Desmond Ford. And, you know, as I said before, my, my, the guy who baptized me, the pastor who baptized me, I mean, he called himself a Ford man and he just felt that Ford had moved too quickly. Um, so, you know, so this was, I mean, I don't know what would have happened if Glacier View hadn't occurred. Uh, maybe we would have got to the place we are now in the church much sooner though I um, can't remember if it's Froome, Froome or Cottrell, but it's, I think it's Froome, but anyway, mentions about, you know, some of the attitudes, you're not going to change the old people, but they'll eventually die, and the young people are already being, uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing it, um, but you have a generation that passes away, and, and that's what's happened to Adventism, I mean, and even to the world, I mean, if you know, if people from 40 years ago could have seen where things would have, the, the, the issues of the day, where they would have tended, uh, they would have taken a much harder stand against what was happening. Um, 
But now we, we have everything, whether it's in the world or in the church or even in this movement, um, we, we've gone far from where God had wanted us to go. And uh, so this anniversary of Desmond Ford's um, trial, uh, how does it illustrate what's happening today? Well, what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark. When the situation on the book of Joel began to be addressed, we saw that there was a, a large division within the movement and really a shaking of how do we choose to study. Okay, and we know, and remember, we also parallel this with 1888. Exactly. But it's very much a parallel with 1888. Mm -hmm. But our situation for today is to see now in the fourth generation, how are we choosing to study? Are we choosing to bring line upon line, comparing what is written like in Ezekiel with that which is written by Mrs. White to try to understand this more clearly? Or are we saying we need the Bible alone and Mrs. White is not important? Yeah. We've had too many that are denominated in name only. We have many within the church, many within the movement that are not choosing to study for themselves. They are choosing that Oh, I can I can listen to Doug Batchelor. I can listen to Walter Vyth. I can listen to, and we can go through a whole bunch of, of different people. I mean, the most recent one for me was this Conrad Vine, who I know nothing about. But I received a, a message this this last weekend that I should listen to Conrad Vine, especially to a presentation that he gave up in the Wasilla Church up in Alaska. And it doesn't matter. These might be, they might be good presentations. Right. But that's not where our attention is to be drawn. So when we're looking at this today, Hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? And then every man in the chambers of his imagery. Not only is this what they're doing in private, it's what's deeply rooted within themselves. Yeah, in our imaginations. Exactly. So when these first two steps occur, the third step then occurs, for they say, the Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. Out of the heart, the voice speaks. If you don't, in these kind of situations, if you are not wanting others to think ill of you, you show one type of representation in front of them, but you have another representation when you're in private. Mm -hmm. So our situation here, when we're looking at this with Ezekiel 8, verse 12, or Ezekiel 9, verse 9, 
we then become confronted because when we're given this looking glass vision, when this occurs, we get to see just how unworthy we are in front of Christ. Mm -hmm. We wind up having to face the inner person and we may not really want to face that inner person. And that's, that's where this Mara vision, when it came to Daniel, when it came to Ezekiel, when it came to so many, it, it dropped their glory into the dust. And isn't that the work of the message of righteousness by faith? That it places the glory of man in the dust. Okay, so we got this this first abomination we, we have is this image of jealousy, and this would be the, the idea that jealousy comes into the movement. Right. Now it's going to manifest itself in these opinions and views in this right. sort of um, taking things into your own hands. God is not, um, you know, God needs me now to be the one who's, um, you know, the movement needs a person, a leader, or something like that, who has this agenda or idea. We so must that, do for God. Yeah. So, so then the next step is this women weeping for Tammuz. Right. So he said also unto me, turn thee yet again. And thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which is toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. Okay, so these women weeping for Tammuz has nothing to do with Lent. Uh, there's no connection no at all um, um, now why are they weeping for Tammuz um, we're probably gonna have a lot of different uh, um, different types of misinformation about this but what is the weeping for Tammuz where, where does this come from Isn't this those that would be that would be crying, wanting um, the resurrection of Tammuz? Okay, so so the question is, what time of year is this? Uh, we would call it summer. We would, uh, in biblically, we would say what either the fourth or the fifth month. Okay, so yeah, so this it's going to be in the month of Tammuz that women weep for Tammuz, right? Right. <laughs> so, right. So, so it's a type of worship that occurs um, uh, in connection with this uh, this month, which, well, we know that um, uh, the fifth day of the fourth month is when Ezekiel's visions begin, right? This one's going to be, and that's the thing is he's going to be seeing this in uh, the sixth year, the fifth day of the sixth month, right? Okay. So he's not he's not actually seeing this in the month of Tammuz, he's seen in the in the month of of uh, Elu, right? So he's seeing it subsequent to the month of Tammuz. Right. So it's going to be like two months later. That, okay. that he actually has sees women weeping for Tammuz, and and my understanding is that this it this has to do with the month of Tammuz. So so he's not seeing something as it happens. He's seeing something symbolic, representational. 
Uh, the women, of course, we're saying are churches. Um, that would be their symbol. Yeah. So, so, so we know Tammuz is a god. It's it's also a month. Um, and so there are different. I mean, obviously, different religions that at different times um, address this. So, but what would the why would the women be weeping for Tammuz? What does that represent? My understanding is that uh, that you have the springtime, things are flourishing, and uh, Tammuz is alive. You, know, with, you have the rain go forth. So in the, in, the, in the region of Babylon, the summers are very dry, and mm -hmm. things just die off. It's just so warm. So in a sense, they, they're reckoning that like, Tammuz is dead, because everything's weathering with the heat and there's no rain and then he's brought to life again whenever the rains come again after the summer and maybe in the autumn uh, but that's what uh, some commentators have suggested would be happening okay um so so this would be something to do with in the summer, just it's drought. So you're 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 weeping. So so exactly what's happening then? Because um, I'm not sure if that's correct or not. But that that I've heard that before. Yeah, you get some uh, commentators saying something different. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different opinions. I, let's put it that way. Okay, so there was some kind of, well, um, in Akkadian literature dealing with Tammuz that had to do with, um, uh, you know, a story having to do with some kind of romantic relationship. But um, so I, I don't know, you know, I don't have an answer to exactly what it is. Um, So any other thoughts on this? I, I mean, I'm trying to find stuff. There isn't a lot in the Bible that I can see that we can reference. Uh, do you have any, any, do the commentators there, the translators, have any uh, verses that they reference us to? Well, I, in, in the 1769 Bible, I didn't find anything. Yeah, I mean, they, I mean, they. Yeah, I don't find anything other than this verse. Right. So, but there's not another reference to women weeping for Tammuz, or, I mean, Tammuz, even um, as a name, uh, we have it where this one time right um so so that makes it a bit difficult to now it means sprout of life and he's a sumerian deity of food and vegetation so according to brown drivers briggs um so this would kind of make sense if you're going to say that it's something to do with the drought of the summer but I'm just saying that when it comes to knowing exactly what this is as far as pagan worship, there isn't a lot of clear information. Well, it, it's interesting in the way that these three verses from 13 to 15 are then combined when we go to the next section, which is 816. Because we're given this break at 13. Our next break comes at 16. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, 
were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worship the sun toward the east. So are the women weeping for Tammuz to the north and the men worshiping the sun to the east being combined? Yeah, that's a good, good question. I mean, so now we know it's they're at the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. Um, so they're weeping for Tammuz there. And then these men, are uh, these um, five and 20 elders are going to be worshiping the, the rising sun. So that's towards the east. Um, are they together? Are these two grouped together? I mean, we, we look at them as progressive. I mean, we know that... Um, the women weeping for Tammuz is going to be represented in uh, Adventist history from 1919 to uh, 1957. So, and it's going to be marked by the two books, um, um, The Doctrine of Christ and Questions on Doctrine. Is it interesting how those two books are both giving reference to the doctrines that they've set aside? Right, exactly. And and so this woman weeping for Tammuz has to relate to that. I mean, we have it here, and you know, and and many people try to attach this to some kind of pagan worship or something that's happening in Christianity or in the Adventist Church or whatever, but. Um, this, these women weeping for Tammuz, they're longing for something. And, and to me, it represents, uh, um, and that's why I think uh, I, the idea that this has something to do with some more r romantic story in the idea of um, pagan worship, that it's sort of, you know, women weeping over some kind of, unrequited love story or something like that. Um, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what the story is because there's different sketchy ideas. But what I see in Adventism in that period is definitely the courting of the Protestants and, and not wanting to be considered a cult. And, and that's something that definitely is, for me as somebody who became an Adventist, was very obvious about Adventists, that they they were embarrassed of their history, they were embarrassed of their church, they didn't want to be called a cult, and they wanted to just be reg recognized as regular Christians. And so I think the women weeping for Tammuz has something to do with that, as far as when we make the application for the Adventist church. Okay. So how do we make the application for the movement? Yeah, so so when we make the application for the movement, we have to take that into account. And um, this to me would re represent what happened to the movement in 2019 with Parminder's group. Because that to me is exactly where the church has gone and uh, this idea to become like the world in dress, in what we listen to and what we take in as news, our opinions, our cultural views, if you want to call them cultural, uh, social views. And that's what happened in 2019. But maybe there's more to it. I think there may be quite a bit more to it. Right. Yeah, I just wish I knew more about what this would because there's just too much contradictory information on it for me on to know what this exactly means. Um, 
See, I was, I, I was of the opinion that when they're weeping for Tammuz, they're weeping for a Christ figure. Well, yeah, and you know, some of that comes from uh, the two Babylons by Hislop, which is not really a very reliable source material. So I'm not sure. Um, you know, there's just. You know. All right. We don't have much in the Bible about this. Mm -hmm. But in this situation here, in 816, he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. Behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar. So we're at the entryway of the holy place, correct? He, um, yeah, between the porch and the altar. There stood five and twenty men. Why is 25 an important symbol? Well, um, it's the number of days between midnight and the midnight cry. But the 5 and 20, is that not the 24 priests for a course plus the high priest? Yeah, that would seem to be correct. Is it also not the number of the president of the general conference plus his vice presidents. Well, that I don't know much about personally, but um, if you say that's there's, I'm, I'm asking a question. I'm not yeah. saying anything. Okay. Well, was, okay. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I've never looked it up. Okay. So. And they have their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east and they worship the sun toward the east. So we have four different sections that the translators had used in this that they used for reference. Now, while we're looking between the porch and the altar, we have Joel, mm -hmm. that book that caused such a division. And that symbol there, uh, 217, that's midnight. Right. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. So you're not weeping to the north. You're not with the women. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give them give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them wherefore should they say among the people where is their god now ezekiel 11 1 would we say this to be a tripling 1 1 1 well it's it could be january 11th okay or the 11th day of the first month. Well, which is January 11th. <laughs> I'm, speaking, I'm speaking in a biblical calendar. Yeah, well, yeah. Because the, yeah. the 11th day of the first month would have been after the sacrificial lamb would, be, would have been chosen. Mm -hmm. Now, this verse reads, Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh eastward, and behold, at the door of the gate, five and twenty men, among whom I saw Jazaniah, the son of Azure, and Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, princes of the people. Now, you have Jazaniah, the son of Azure, listed here in in Ezekiel 11, 1. But when we when we were looking at this before, we had Jazaniah 
the son of Shaphan? Are these two different people? I would understand that to be that they are different. Okay. So twice the Lord has called. What is the what is the meaning of Azure? So you have Yah has called, and that person is the son of a rock rabbit or one that is in hiding. And Azur means he assists. It what? He that assists. Okay. He that assists. Um, interesting. It protects or aids. Right. So now Mary's brother was named what? In the New Testament, who was Mary's brother in the New Testament? Martha and Mary were weeping because their brother had died. Yeah, well, Lazarus. Right. And Lazarus's name is in the Greek, but in the Hebrew, his name is what? Um, um, it's on the tip of my tongue. Eliezer. Eliezer. Uh, Eliezer. <laughs> now, Eliezer, Lazarus, we have applied as also being one that assists. So my question here is the son of Azure, since this is one that assists, is this also not giving us a symbol of the Holy Spirit? Well, possibly. I mean. Okay, now this other person, Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah. What do we find these names mean? Well, Yah has delivered. Okay. And uh, Benaniah means Yah has built. Okay. So when we're looking at these men, these two men and their lineage. Is this possible that this is showing us the movement itself? Okay, so you're taking Ezekiel chapter 11. Right. And, and you're now trying to apply it to the four generations that we're applying to the movement. Right. Okay. Um, I know it's in the same vision, um, but it's it's not one. I mean, you're going to have these uh, twenty-five princes that are going to be the men that devise mischief and give the wicked counsel in this city. Um. So you're saying this is sort of related to. The five and twenty elders weeping for Tammuz because well, of the number. I'm asking the question because we're given the five and twenty again. So we're comparing this with the five and twenty that are worshiping the sun. But now we're beholding at the gate five and twenty men, among whom I I saw Jazaniah, the son of Azure, and Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah. Yeah. 
as princes of the people. So, so these are going to be this story where um, they're not, I mean, they think that they're protected by God because they're in the city of Jerusalem. They're not cast off like the other ones spread, you know, the, the captivity of the ten tribes. And so they think it's not going to happen to them what happened to the ten tribes. Right. That was what we got from Ezekiel chapter 11 in a very simplified way. And the promise that's going to be made to them is the one of the new heart. Right. Um, and uh, I'm just looking ahead here. Right. So they're going to go into captivity anyway. God's going to warn them of that. I mean, the way that we've always applied this is, well, again, I, I've, I've used this as an example of Adventism. So it would be that, uh, you know, that same history, I guess, if we apply it to Adventism that we see from, uh, well, definitely since 1957, when we were so happy that uh, Walter Martin declared that we weren't a cult anymore even though we have to give up some fundamental doctrines to do so, like the sanctuary and the nature of Christ. Just some? <laughs> I thought we abandoned all of our fundamental doctrines with this. Well, not on the surface, but definitely at the root. Well, when you're saying not on the surface and definitely on the root, is that also not the same thing as it being hidden? Yeah, because yeah, because many Adventists they were happy with the results, right? Um, but if, of course, if they would have seen what would develop from that uh, book, I mean, they wouldn't have been happy at the time. But you know, they thought this was a, a greater opportunity to get the gospel to the Protestant churches. We are not a cult anymore. That's going to open up the doors, so that. Um, one is we're not going to feel embarrassed to go to our neighbors because we're not a cult anymore. Um, not recognizing what price was paid to get that sort of uh, um, PR from the evangelicals. I mean, it basically was the undoing of Adventism. I mean, obviously these other things had happened first. But it was progressive. But definitely 1957, questions on doctrine. Uh, destroys Adventism doctrinally. And, and, and M. L. Andreasen in that period, I mean, he's addressing, of course, the nature of Christ and the investigative judgment, the atonement at being uh, ongoing, not completed at the cross, as the questions on doctrine uh, tries to twist Ellen White's writings to, to say. So, you know, so even M. L. Andreasen, he can see these two doctrines being attacked, but I don't think he fully understood how that would play out. Um, definitely, he wouldn't have seen foreseen Desmond Ford, like just a total repudiation of the prophetic foundation of Adventism. So, so it's hidden in that sense, but it manifests itself in in what follows. Yeah, it definitely does that. <laughs> now, as this was continuing, translators also saw Jeremiah 2.27 and 32.33, saying to a stock, thou art my father, and to a stone, thou hast brought me forth. For they have turned their back unto me, and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will say, Arise and save us. And they have turned unto me the back, and not the face. Though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. I read something like that, and my mind is taken 
to the quarterlies because for the last many years, we're not teaching anything, we're spoon feeding. We are not going out to put meat before the people. We keep the milk before the people because we don't want strong Bible believing, Bible understanding people within the church. We want them reliant upon the leadership, upon the ministers for everything that goes on. And we have Deuteronomy 419. And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. Now, of course, um, the idea there is um, God's going into how they're not to get involved in idolatry. Right. And so in verse 18, um, so you're not going to make all these different idols, right? Like the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth, lest thou and lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven. And when thou seest the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all the host of heaven, shouldst be driven to worship them. So the connection between the worship of idols and the worship of the heavens uh, definitely is a Babylonish idea. I mean, other religions have it as well. But their idols are representations of the gods in the sky that they see. And... Um, now, how would that relate then, you know, if we're going to, to take this idolatry and we're going to look at it in that, that sense, this, uh, um, well, you have the worship of these idols portrayed. And, and, and I had this idea that it's like, a, you know, a, a planetarium, you know, where you have the, the constellations displayed on the, uh, the sky or the ceiling. Um, and another interesting point about this. In Egyptian tombs, um, they have on the ceiling of the tombs um, the date that the person died. And, and the way that they do that is by the depiction of these gods. Um, so because the gods represent the constellations. And so how these constellations are being represented by these gods is telling you the date. You can actually date specifically uh, because it's representing the sky, and the sky only ever really exists in one way at one time. It doesn't repeat. And um, so you can d d date these Egyptian tombs, the date of these different uh, kings, um, in this way. So, so the idea of dates, chronology, is related to this idea of uh, these depictions of these gods, if you want to look at it that way. So what would be the difference here between what we're doing with chronology, because we are using the sky in a sense, because that's how you do the Hebrew calendar, and this pagan worship of these deities connected with the host of heaven. What would be the difference Well, we would be worshiping the God who created all these yeah, and, planets yeah. and stars and so forth. It's not we're not saying they are they are God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so this perversion of the sky or the God's calendar in this pagan worship, what is it then? What what how would we represent that in in the present day? What moon. do you mean, like, like, oh? Well, I'm not saying so much horoscopes or things like that, but um, 
because this has to do with prophecy, right? God is in control of prophecy, the times and the seasons. I think it definitely has to do with prophecy. Okay. So how can we tell the difference then between true prophecy, you know, the true calendar, the, the chronology that we're using, and that of the Protestants or the world or Parminder's movement or even what's happening in the movement um, in connection with the Trump prediction, let's say. Well, is, there, is there any connection? I have to think about that. My, my mind is running more toward uh, the fact that many today are actually worshiping the creation rather than the creator by their claims of climate change. That all of this with this quote unquote Green New Deal boils down to a worship of the creation and the setting aside of the creator because they believe they can control the climate where, I mean, they have no control over it. Okay. Uh, well, there definitely would be a parallel there. I mean, though I think the Green New Deal is more about money in the pockets of the elites rather well, it's than not true. More, <laughs> exactly. Then, uh, I mean, they're using that as an excuse, but. That's um, also another idol. Yeah. But, but I think in this movement, I mean, if we're going to try to see what idolatry is here in Deuteronomy, it's going to be connected with the worship of the sky, the gods in the sky. So you've got the, the idols themselves, but those are just representations of what's happening in the sky, right? Because that's where the gods are. Um, so, I mean, People have actually criticized me personally in that I'm actually doing astrology or I'm worshiping uh, the sky because I use calendars or, you know, they may even argue that, you know, I'm, I'm using a Gregorian calendar or a Julian calendar or a Mayan calendar or the Islamic calendar, all these pagan calendars, pagan Roman calendars, right? The pagan Rome and the papal Rome calendar. And, and and they say you can't use any calendar at all, right? Any any calendar at all is idolatry. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we know that, that that's obviously not the case. But in, in this case, if we're going to talk about idolatry in the movement as a symbol, I mean, you have the sun worship part, which we, we haven't really addressed in the movement. Um, but you do have the the I don't, you know the women weeping for Tammuz, which is obviously uh, relating to gods um, in the heavens, and then also these portraying of these idols on the walls. So, what would these represent specifically as an error within the movement? Well, again, holding on to Protestant definitions of things, setting aside Miller's rules, um, lifting up man in the place of God. There's, there's multiple things. I mean, we are, but we're also for today coming toward the close of our meeting. Yeah. So should we delve back into Ezekiel 8, 16 and 17 for tomorrow? Well, yeah, we can refer to them. I mean, because um, there's not much left there. We've, we've, we can finish that off um, tomorrow and then continue in Judges chapter 10. Right. Um, okay. 
Yeah, so kind of think about that question maybe. Okay. How does this this fourth one, the four and uh, the five and twenty elders worshiping with their back towards the temple and worshiping the sun towards the east? I mean, I mean that's the Sunday law, but how does that apply in our movement? Right. So we pick this portion back up. For the verse that comes to me when you're talking about that is 2 Peter 3, 4, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Uh, they're not following these, these presentations in the morning, then they are stalemated. They're stalled. They're not advancing. So in their minds, all things continue as they were. I mean, it's like going over, as Dwight said, the the quarterly uh when i first came into this movement when i started re-examining the quarterly i was calling it a diluted gospel i would say more than that it's a deluded gospel it is it's trash a lot of it is just plain trash i couldn't stand it i had to leave the church so um yeah, we need to be advancing. And I, as I said before, the only way that I've really been able to advance spiritually is by attending these these presentations and by, by reading a lot on my own and really seeking God privately for light. Well, thanks. Yeah, we'll look at that again tomorrow. Okay, Dwight. Okay. Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we need your guidance to understand properly these symbols. You have a purpose and you have a reason for all of these visions that were given to Ezekiel. We recognize that Ezekiel is the prophet for this time to this movement. Help us now, Father as we go through our day to consider what you have presented here and for that which we have discussed. May your blessing be upon each that have attended this meeting today and for those that will view this, this later via the internet. Direct us now so that as we walk, we may more properly represent your character before all that we come in contact with. We have great need of you. We can do nothing without you. To this end, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.